Hello, it's Sunday, the 23rd of October 2022. Uh, me, you, laser discs, let's go. Right, uh, John Borman's Excalibur um, from uh, the movie from, from 1981. Uh, this is a Warner home video laser disc release from uh, 1991, so, so 10 years later. Um, contrary to what certain uh, writings might indicate, I'm a huge John Borman fan. Uh, yes, he's made a few turkeys, but most great directors have. Um, I, I like most of his films, uh, to be perfectly honest, and um, I think Excalibur um, is. I think Excalibur and Deliverance they sort of uh, they're sort of neck and neck for me as to you know my favorite my favorite John Borman film. Um, so yeah, this is you know a movie uh, about King Arthur, of course. Um, I mean. L there are lots of movies uh, about King Arthur, uh, Camelot, the Knights of the Round Table, etc., etc. There are three good ones. Uh, there's um, Lancelot du Lac by Robert Bresson. There's Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and there's this uh, this one, John Borman's John Borman's Excalibur. So, yeah, I mean, there there are lots of reasons why I, I like Excalibur. I mean, it, it's sort of it's the it's the kind of movie we'll never see again, really. Uh, when when you think about it, um, it's um, you know this sort of dark, grimy uh, tale, dark ages tale, you know, of of murder and lust, uh, you know, um, you know, slathered in mud and blood, uh, with sort of bizarre, you know, otherworldly stuff like sorcery. Um, and I mean, it it covers um, Arthur's life cycle in like 140 minutes, uh, and it squeezes a lot in, you know, the the, the Lady of the Lake, uh, the Sword and the Stone, the the Quest for the Holy Grail, the Fisher King, um, you know, um, Morgana and, and all that stuff. I mean, in 140 minutes, I mean, that wouldn't happen these days. Like these days, I mean, can you imagine what would happen if Peter Jackson was to do a King Arthur thing? It would be like a trilogy and each movie would be like three hours long, you know. So, and it's, you know, and there's also the fact that this is all obviously um, pre, pre-CGI. pre I mean, there are a lot of things in Excalibur that are kind of kind of clunky uh, that sort of don't really work. I mean, the um, the narrative is sort of very rushed. It's, it's sometimes it's difficult to, go, to sort of get a fix on on the passage of time. I mean, there's a lot of ponderous dialogue. There's a lot of atrocious dubbing. Uh, there's a lot of sound stages. Um, there's there's a lot of high camp, uh, and yet it doesn't matter. The movie is frigging awesome. Um, you know. It, what even the stuff that that cries out to be mocked the film is still like rousing and exciting in in the best possible way it's got a great cast um you've got Nigel Terry as Arthur you have um uh, Nicol Williamson as, as Merlin who's uh, who's really good in this like he sort of plays everything um like it's like he responds to everything with this air of like vast amusement uh, you've got Helen Mirren as as Morgana um you've got uh Nicholas Clay a, a, as Lancelot and um Sherry Lungy as Guinevere um, you know, it's just it's just great, and there's all these like um, like young, or relatively unknown actors at the time that would sort of become big later on, like uh, Patrick Stewart, Liam Neeson, Gabriel Byrne, Kieran Hines. You know, um, yeah, just a just a just a great film all around. It just has this amazing look. It's like gazing at a a um, like a, a a blunt instrument through a, through a, a gazy sort of haze. It's just you know, it's it's just great. Um, yeah, and I think that um, um, I also like. I mean, one of the things I like is the fight sequences. Like, they're not. There's not none of this sort of like implausible gracefulness in the fight scenes. Like, these are guys uh, that are sort of very obviously weighed down by heavy plate armor and you know heaving broadswords at each other. And it's all very sort of you know clunky, and you don't really see fights like that. Uh, I mean, I think the only one, the only other one I can think of that springs to mind is. Um, uh, Robin and Marion, the Richard Lester Robin Hood film with the fight sequence at the end between Sean Connery and Robert Shaw where they're sort of like heaving heavy swords at each other and, you know, it's 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 like that. But, um, yeah. The um, the final battle sequence between um, Arthur and, and Mordred um, is, is really... It's really balls to the wall, the film. It just builds up to such an incredible climax. And even... Um, I, I think we can probably uh, credit or blame this movie for uh, Carl Orff's um, o, o Fortuna for becoming, like, you know, ubiquitous uh, battle music. Um, but, yeah, it, it works really well. The music in this is is absolutely great uh, as, as well. Uh, Borman actually tried to make this movie... Um, 
uh, a long time before he actually did it. It was sort of a pet project for him. Uh, he, he wanted to make it originally in the early 1970s. He offered it to um, United Artists. Uh, they counter-offered with um, the chance to direct a, a film adaptation of, of um, Lord of the Rings. Uh, that fell through eventually. And then Borman, he sort of made a few movies. Um, Deliverance, which was a big success. Um, Zardoz and Exodus to the Heretic, which were not. Um, and then he, he sort of went back to um, the, the project, uh, Excalibur, which at the time was called Merlin, and uh, that was um, he worked on that for a few years, and it was his first film after Exodus to the Heretic, and it was a, it was a pretty big it was a pretty big success. Um, I have seen this movie uh, quite a few times. Uh, three years ago, I did I did go to a, a cinema screening of it, um, and it just it works. You know, it works especially well um, on the on the big screen, and and yeah, really happy to get this this uh, laser disc edition because it just looks gorgeous. I mean, one of the things uh, about laser disc is I can't think of a of a home video format that is better suited to just showcasing like great sleeve artwork and I mean look at that that is the classic um Excalibur artwork by uh, Bob Peake who is who did very sort of vivid impressionistic uh, film posters um yeah I mean that just that just looks great I mean Bob Peake he's probably my favorite um film poster uh, film poster artist of all time and um yeah I'd love to get there is a book um of his work um I think the English version is 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 um long out of print and very expensive there is a Japanese version which um, I'm sort of interested in getting but yeah Excalibur what a what a movie uh the great white hype um this is yeah this is an interesting film uh, I think I'm sort of you'll have to forgive me I'm, I'm working off like long ago memories uh the last time I saw this movie was when it was a, a home video uh, new release um which is quite a long time ago this movie is from from 1996 this is a 20th Century Fox uh, Laserdisc release. Um, so it stars Samuel L. Jackson, uh, and it's it's a, a satire of um, of boxing, the the boxing industry. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson plays a sort of uh, Don King um, uh, kind of figure. And what, the premise of the movie um, is that uh, I think the ratings or people aren't really paying attention to boxing because there's no there's perceived to be no entertainment value in watching value in watching uh, two black guys beating each other up and um uh Samuel L. Jackson's character um sort of comes up with the idea of uh of getting a white guy uh you know that as as a sort of uh you know as a novel thing to get people uh back back watching boxing and they um so the champion uh, sorry is played by Damon Wayans uh he's um playing at the heavyweight boxing champion uh, Jim the Grim Reaper Roper and they come up with this idea of getting uh, the only guy that ever actually beat him, which was a white guy called Terry Conklin, who's played by Peter Berg, um, they'll get him uh, to fight to fight um, uh, to fight Roper, and they sort of they sort of they get this guy, uh, you know, who ha he hasn't boxed for a while, um, Terry Conklin, and they sort of rebrand him as Irish Terry Conklin, like they sort of play up this whole he's not Irish, but they play him up as this Irishman. They have all this like shamrocks and leprechauns and all this, you know, really gaudy, tacky uh, Irish shit, uh, and you know, so it's um, yeah, and it's it's got a good cast. It's got Jeff Goldblum. Um, John Lovitz is in this. Um, I, who else is in this? Um, uh, oh, Cor Corbin Burnson and Cheech Marin are, are in it, I think. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I like this movie, uh, you know, when I was younger, I mean, I didn't really, I mean, I didn't really know too much about boxing, but you know, it's, it still worked for me. Um, yeah, it's, um, directed by Reginald Hudlin, who's, who's a really good filmmaker. He directed, um, House Party, the 1990 uh, movie with Kid and Play. And he also, um, 1992, he directed, um, Boomerang, the Eddie Murphy romantic comedy. That's, a, that's actually a really, a really good film. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm sort of keen to, to rewatch this and see, see if it holds up. Um, I do have it. I do have it on DVD. Um, and also it was, uh, written, the screenplay it was written by um tony hendra and ron shelton uh, they both have really good credits uh tony hendra was a, a british um oxbridge comedian he he was a writer for national lampoon in the 1970s um he's probably best known uh for his on-screen performance as uh the band manager ian faith in uh, this is spinal tap and uh, ron shelton who co-wrote this film uh is a guy who wrote and directed um uh, bull durham and uh, White Man Can't Jump and Cobb. So, you know, sports movies are like his stock in trade, although this is much broader and more satirical than than those other films I just mentioned. Yeah, so, yeah. I think, and I mean, we sort of, uh, we kind of take Samuel L. Jackson for granted these days, but this, I, I think, I could be wrong, but this could be his first, like, starring role, like the f first movie he ever got top billing in. I mean, before this, I mean, he was, you know, he'd, he'd had supporting roles in Spike Lee movies and, and stuff and he done i mean he did do um pulp fiction before this 
Um, but I think I'm open to correction, but I think this could be uh, the first movie that Samuel L. Jackson um, actually headlined. Uh, okay. Uh, natural born killers. Um, yeah, I'm think I'm going to, this is way too heavy for, uh, oh, that's better. Yep. Yep. Okay. So the, the 1994, the infamous 1994, uh, Oliver Stone movie, uh, you know, the, um, satire of, of mass murderers and, um, you know, the, the media's gl uh, glorification of serial killers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Oliver Stone is an incredibly, um, divisive figure. Um, I, I mean, personally, I'm a fan uh, up to a point. Uh, he had a pretty he had a pretty terrific run, I feel, of movies between 1986 and uh, 1997. So basically between Salvador and um, Nixon. Uh, I like Natural Born Killers. It's one of my favorite Oliver Stone films. I can sort of see the problems people have with it. You know that it's it's very sensational. It's you know very sensationalistic. Um, but you know just uh, just as uh, as pure as filmmaking craft. Um, you know, it's it's wonderfully edited. You know, it's it's got some really good performances, um, headed of course by Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis and Robert Downey Jr. as uh, the uh, tabloid uh, news journalist Wayne Gale. It's an absolutely great performance. You know, I love that. I love his phony Australian accent. Um, yeah, so I, I actually bought this this uh, this laser disc locally um, from a, from a local seller, and this is the 1996 director's cut version. It's a pretty big box. I, I don't know how many discs it is. It's like you know, it's it's quite a few discs, quite a few discs long. Um, yeah, I, I have seen Natural Born Killers on on the big screen a few times. It, it's pretty good, um, based on an original script by uh, Quentin Tarantino that was extensively uh, rewritten, much to to Tarantino's consternation. I have to say, I mean, I've read uh, Tarantino's screenplay. It is published in book form. Um, I say this as someone who is much more of a fan of Quentin Tarantino than Oliver Stone. I think Stone's movie actually improves on Tarantino's um, uh, script, which, I mean, Tarantino's script, it would have led to a very different sort of smaller scale um, uh, sort of movie. Uh, and the thing is, I mean, I don't think that Stone's movie is really a, a distortion of Tarantino's script. It's like an elaboration of it. Like, um, it, it doesn't really change much of what Tarantino wrote. It just adds a lot of stuff to it. Um, yeah, I mean, you could, if you could, um, if you got Stone's Natural Born Killers and you um, deleted a lot of material from it and maybe threw in some film material that was deleted from the final film, you would actually have a, a version of the film that's remarkably close to to what uh, Tarantino wrote, like most of what is in Tarantino's script. Um, yeah, but that's a, that's a bit of a, that, that's a bit of a debate. But anyway, yeah, this is a, this is a really good release. Glad to have this. Um, yeah, and sort of uh, historical uh, importance. Uh, here we have the limited edition commemorative uh, box set of John Huston's The African Queen, which is actually the very first laser disc I bought. Um, I had no intention of buying laser discs at all. I d didn't have a laser disc player or anything like that, but I saw this for $10 and it was just, you know, I have to, you know, $10, this is a pretty great set. Um, yeah, so it's actually it's chock full of stuff more so than than just the the actual disc. I mean, I'll 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 show you. So here is here is the the laser disc itself. Yep. We've got uh I think there's eight um uh replica lobby cards. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is is that more than eight? Uh, we have a replica of the shooting script um, for the movie. Yep. So, and finally, we have a hardback copy of uh, Catherine Hepburn's memoirs uh, regarding the making of the film, the making of the African Queen, or how I went to Africa with Bogart, Bacall, and Houston, and almost lost my mind. So, yeah, getting this for ten dollars? Are you kidding me? This is great. Uh, the movie uh, itself, The African Queen, of course, you know, great movie, classic movie starring um, Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn, you know, two of my favourite, two of my favourite screen presences of all time. I just love, I'm all in on Bogart, Bogart and, and Hepburn. And this is the only movie they made together, um, actually. This is in uh, 1951. They'd never been in a movie uh, prior to this point. Uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, the movie uh, Bogart and, and Catherine Hepburn on a steamer in, you know, sort of World War One era Africa and they're sort of... Um, 
riverside adventures and like the nitpicking and the feuding and then uh battling germans and stuff so it's like a you know a sort of romantic comedy adventure film and it's it's really really good you can't really go wrong with with this movie um bogart um won a best actor academy award um his only academy award uh for this movie in uh, you know 1951 um uh, it was actually in in hindsight you know it was it was a bit of a it was in, it came at an interesting point of, of you know of the industry because he sort of it was like a, a victory for the old guard bogart had obviously been been in films for quite a long time at that point and he beat um marlon brando for uh, streetcar named desire and montgomery clift for a place in the sun so he was beating these like you know young upstart you know new york stage actors who were like you know starting to make inroads in in, in film um I think if the Academy had its time again, they probably would have given it to to Brando uh, because his performance in Streetcar Named Desire is, um, you know, it's, you know, it's this iconic, um, you know, uh, transformative, this role that sort of, you know, transformed Hollywood and everything. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think Berger, It was kind of like a validation Oscar, which we do see happen, you know, all throughout history. Uh, I I think. I mean, personally, do I think Bogart should have won an Academy Award for this movie? Uh, I would say I I don't think so. He's great in this movie. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, he gave better performances in in other films like you know Casablanca, uh, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, um, In a Lonely Place. Like this was kind of you know the uh, you know let let's give him an Oscar because we didn't give him one before sort of sort of deal. Um, you know, would I would I have given it to Brando if I was in charge? You know, if I was, if I was inexplicably alive in in 1951 or 52 or whatever? Um, I, I don't know. There were probably, but I mean, there were there were other good performances that year. I mean, Alastair Sim uh, in in A Christmas Carol as as Ebenezer Scrooge that was a pretty fantastic performance. That would be. I don't think he was even nominated uh, that year, but that was a good performance. So, yeah. So there we go. Not bad for ten dollars, uh, is it? <laughs> See you next time, huh?